So are we online? Hello, yeah. everyone. I hope you've joined us for the talk today, which is being hosted by uh, TAP India, which is a coming together of several uh, leading galleries in the metros, uh, Bombay and uh, Delhi and Chennai. And we have uh, a lot of well-known names, people I have been working with over the years as an arts journalist. I've been covering art and culture for the last 17 or 18 years. And uh, I have been looking into the idea of what is considered, uh, you know, obscenity. I have been faced with several stories where I have reported on that. One was uh, Balbi Krishan's work, which uh, has been attacked many times by the right wing forces, uh, you know, at the time when uh, Section 377 was uh, still there and it has been removed. So that would show you that society changes with time and the obscenity law also needs to be looked at in context with society and how it is, you know, sort of uh, changing and, and it cannot be one static thing that looks at uh, obscenity in a particular manner over the years. And so we have uh, wonderful uh, people who have joined us today. There is Arshia Sethi from the Cree Foundation, a small uh, nonprofit uh, organization working in the field of public art. And she has been looking at this idea of art and obscenity as part of a, a six-fold um, uh, series that she's working uh, working on and looking at. And we have uh, the senior counsel from the Delhi High Court, uh, Akhil Sibyl, uh, you know, joining us, giving us the perspective on the law. And uh, he is very famous for the croc case, uh, which he cracked. Uh, so we are, we're gonna ask him about that later on. So without further ado, uh, I would like to um, introduce both our bring bring both our speakers uh, online. Uh, uh, would you like to take it on, Arshia, and put uh, take it on from there? Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Georgina, for this wonderful introduction. You've really put already the context into place, so we could actually start off. And I know that Akil Sibyl has so much demand on his time. Uh, as probably one of the most important litigation lawyers in the country today, uh, certainly hailed as the smartest and the one who is the weapon of the week. This is how you were described in a very recent uh, article in the press. And I thought that was absolutely a wonderful explanation. But if I were to do things in the correct manner, I'd like to just thank TAP for giving us this opportunity to talk about a very, very important subject. Given the fast changing nature of of uh, governance in India and legal issues. We had a very important judgment being passed yesterday. Uh, the environment is constantly in a flux, a word that you will encounter several times as I talk uh, uh, to uh, you about, uh, talk to uh, you, Akhil, about uh, the, around the issues that we are talking about. Now, uh, even as I welcome you, uh, and we are meeting again after, I think, December 15th, so I am delighted to be with you. Even as I am delighted to be with you, I'm actually a little disconcerted in a way, having to have this conversation with you because all along we've always believed that art is about free expression and law is about limits, prescriptions, regulations, containing things in the correct manner. Now, if art, as you may well argue, is an Article 19 thing subject to reasonable restrictions, then the question that I ask you is that in this constant flux-oriented world, who decides what is reasonable? Uh, who constitutes the censor board or the certification board? Because, you know, actually in films, we have a certification, certification board, which is about ageism. And what happens to art that does not seem to be make, able to make the cut of being declared not difficult uh, or um, not disobedient? And my final question in this series of small questions, Akhil, is, is it a good idea to get used to uh, seeing through the filter of law art? Is that normal? Thank you. That's a lot of food for thought and a lot to answer. Thank you, Arshia, for uh, that very generous introduction. Thank you, Georgina, and thank you to TAP for organizing this. Uh, great to be here, and thank you to everyone for joining in. 
Um, okay, let me try and tackle that. It's a tough one. Um, and I think, but I think it's a, it's a very important and a good question because it's something which I think many people wonder about. Uh, you know, why should someone who is not an artist judge the legality of art? And uh, what does an artist know about law? Uh, when we think of an artist and a lawyer, um, two very different personalities come to mind. When we think of art, we think of freedom, freedom of thought and freedom of creative expression. But when we think of law, we think of rules, as you said, boundaries and controls. So the two seem antithetical to one another in conflict with each other, if you will. So what is the foundation for this intersection? And why is it inevitable? And it is inevitable. Art is certainly a form of self-expression, but it's not always private expression because an artist shares her creations with society, with others. And the moment that society comes into the picture, the realm of rules that govern members of that society and that embody a certain order to which the society subscribes are triggered. And part of that realm of societal regulation is the system of laws that governs that society. The charter of our independent country is our constitution. And that's the fountainhead of the principles that govern our particular country. So when we look at our constitution, we find that the freedom of speech and expression is not an absolute right without restriction. Uh, the state is permitted to formulate laws which impose reasonable restrictions on the exercise of this right in order to serve certain larger societal interests that justify a restriction of the right. Decency and morality are two such interests identified, enumerated in our constitution as being legitimate grounds on which to impose reasonable restrictions on the exercise of the right of freedom of speech and expression. Now, I, I often get this question and people often query uh, as to whether there should be any limit to freedom of expression. It sounds attractive. Why have any limit? limit? It's freedom after all. It should be allowed to uh, have its full play. And some people are under a mistaken impression that somehow in other jurisdictions, Western jurisdictions, there is absolute freedom of speech and expression, which we are deprived of in India. But that's not true. And once you think a little more carefully, you begin to realize that this freedom cannot be allowed absolutely. And there is no jurisdiction that I'm aware of that does so. Freedom of expression has to be balanced with other competing interests, which are equally valuable. So for instance, uh, we would all agree that you ought not to be permitted in the name of freedom of expression, freedom of speech to sexually harass someone or defame someone or shout fire um, in a crowded uh, cinema hall that you know to be a false statement and cause panic. So once we get past that and we realize that freedom of expression has to have some limits and it can't be absolute. And when it intersects with society, um, other people's rights can get affected. You then wonder whether the police and the courts should be the ones to decide whether a particular work of art violates that boundary. But who else can it be? Surely not the government. Ultimately, someone has to have the last word on the issue. And that must rest with an independent court. We certainly don't want it resting with a majoritarian parliament or government. Because remember, if your speech is consistent with majority speech, then you don't need protection because the majority protects you. It's only when your expression goes against the norm, it challenges the status quo, it, where it, when it questions 
the prevailing majoritarian view, that's when you need legal protection against the majority to protect your individual freedom. And so leaving it in the hands of the government would be extremely dangerous. So I think that gives you a sense at least of why perhaps um, some restrictions have to be there and um, also how, how, law, how law and freedom of expression, including art intersect. So I take what your argument that you're making, or let me say, were I to take the argument that you are making, I find I bump into another thing that needs a little resolution. So I request you to do that for us. I find, for instance, a wide range of principles of law uh, from around the world that deal with art and obscenity. Uh, from the very sharp and rather pithy and easy to remember argument of, I will know it when I see it, which was offered by um, Justice uh, Potter Stewart, I think from the US Supreme Court, uh, to a far more detailed and more convoluted articulation of, uh, you know, that you must not see a work in its isolations, but in its totality, that you have to go by prevailing community standards and that you should try and leave the sexual aspect out of it uh, as long as it is not dehumanizing, does not involve children in some other cases. And this I'm drawing out from many countries. You know, I try to catch up on uh, law in different countries and um, Japan and Korea in, e in Asia, Canada and the US and the West were some of the things, and of course UK, were some of the issues, I, some of the areas I looked at. Uh, there's also this reference to a Hicklin test, Hicklin test, yeah. Uh, so I really don't understand, are these what India follows or do we have something unique to India? Because as compared to many other countries in the world, we are bumping into this problem a lot more often. Yeah, so, you know, it's it's been an evolution over time and we haven't adopted, um, you know, the tests uh, employed elsewhere, um, as they are, we've sort of modified it a little bit. And ultimately, without getting into uh, too much legalese, uh, the test that prevails now is the community standards test, which is of course, uh, has an inbuilt flexibility because that standard keeps changing. So it's intended to evolve with, with the time. And so what may be considered obscene at one point in time down the line uh, you know, may be considered to be in consonance with contemporary uh, standards. And ultimately, if you think about it, given that there is a, an inherent subjectivity to it, it has to be, it's logical to base it on uh, some sort of standard. But that, that you know, leads to a larger uh, issue, which again, it's a little difficult uh, for people to comprehend because the first thing that you know an artist says, uh, and rightly so, the first thought is, but look, um, isn't this all highly subjective? How can you possibly have an objective test? How can you formulate it for something that is so uh, inherently uh, subjective? Um, and and you know that that's a legitimate thought. Um, I mean, does does obscenity not lie in the eye of the beholder? Uh, if yes then how can there be an objective law to decide whether a particular work of art is obscene or not? So let me, uh, you know, without tracing the, the evolution right from the beginning, but it's really from the 60s that, um, you know, this issue started to be fleshed out. But if I can fast forward a little bit, um, it still takes us a ways back to uh, the Supreme Court in Samaresh Bose in, in 1985. Uh, which, uh, you know, where, where the court was dealing with an, uh, the alleged obscenity of a Bengali novel, Prajapati. And, and the court elaborated uh, and explained how you would go about um, applying an objective test to a somewhat subjective realm. And, and let me read out how the court formulated it, because I think it gives a good sense of how the law looks at this. Uh, so the court said, Though the court must consider the question objectively with an open mind, yet 
in the matter of objective assessment, the subjective attitude of the judge hearing the matter is likely to influence, even though unconsciously, his mind and his decision on the question. A judge with a Puritan and prudish outlook may, on the basis of an objective assessment of any book or story or article, and you can apply this to art, consider the same to be obscene. It is possible that another judge with a different kind of outlook may not consider the same book to be obscene on his objective assessment of the very same book. The concept of obscenity is molded to a very great extent by the social outlook of the people who are generally expected to read the book. It is beyond dispute that the concept of obscenity usually differs from country to country depending on the standards of morality of contemporary society in different countries. In our opinion, in judging the question of obscenity, the judge in the first place should try to place himself in the position of the author and from the viewpoint of the author, you can substitute artist, the judge should try to understand what is it that the author seeks to convey and whether what the author conveys has any literary and artistic value. The judge should thereafter place himself in the position of a reader of every age group in whose hands the book is likely to fall and should try to appreciate what kind of possible influence the book is likely to have in the minds of the readers. A judge should thereafter apply his judicial mind dispassionately to decide whether the book in question can be said to be obscene within the meaning of section 292 of the IPC by an objective assessment of the book as a whole and also of the passages complained of as obscene separately. And in appropriate cases, and this is important, the court for eliminating any subjective element or personal preference which may remain hidden in the subconscious mind and may unconscious, unconsciously affect a proper objective assessment may draw upon the evidence on record and also consider the views expressed by reputed or recognized authors of literature on such questions if there be any for his own consideration and satisfaction to enable the court to discharge the duty of making a proper assessment. So you can take the benefit of expert evidence if it is a realm which requires that kind of expertise. So this gives you a sense of you know, how the court goes about applying an objective standard. Now you may still feel, well, you know, this still is um, left to the subjective satisfaction of individuals who may not have that degree of knowledge or appreciation. And, and that is an issue. But as I said at the outset, the question is, what's the alternative? Because if you recognize that there is this intersection and there has to be some limit, then as of now, there is no formulation of how that safeguard is to be applied, except through the courts, because the only other authority we have is the government. And as I said, that's far more dangerous. Now, there's another aspect uh, in answering your question that's important, uh, because it's, again, something which, uh, you know, a person, uh, when they think of obscenity, may not appreciate. And an artist who is thinking about um, what may or may not be obscene uh, should know that the law is very, very clear that obscenity is not the same as vulgarity. So obscenity, we should not confuse it with a dictionary definition or uh, you know, some sort of colloquial understanding of obscenity as something which is distasteful, unpleasant, unappealing. You know, That's not obscenity as far as the law is concerned. It's a legal term of art which has a, a legal meaning that courts have given it uh, over time. And so in this very judgment, uh, the court draws this distinction and says a vulgar writing is not necessarily obscene. Vulgarity arouses a feeling of disgust and revulsion, revulsion and also boredom, but does not have the effect of depraving, debasing and corrupting the morals of any reader of the novel, whereas obscenity has the tendency to deprave and corrupt those whose minds are open to such immoral influences. So if we see um, uh, you know, the law as it's evolved, uh, obscenity has been put into um, uh, 
an extreme end of the spectrum and it is something content which is sexual in nature at a very extreme end of the spectrum so mere nudity um, you know is not to be confused with obscenity and certainly vulgarity is not to be confused with obscenity um, i'll i'll just quickly refer to a couple of interesting uh, cases which um, uh, you know formulated the test uh, in terms of who is the person and this is an important component of this test that we need to think about because if you if as i as i read out um, the supreme court says you think about the perspective of the artist and then you think about the perspective of the viewer now who is that viewer so in k a abbas's case where the court was dealing with censorship of a documentary called a tale of four cities the court said our standards must be so framed that we are not reduced to a level where the protection of the least capable and the most depraved amongst us determines what the morally healthy cannot view or read so that's the test of who is the viewer the uh, that the court is thinking about and um you know i i i i should mention raj kapoor's case um where uh, the supreme court was dealing with allegations of obscenity against satyam shivam sundaram uh, which some of us may recall um was a, a you know a, a movie perhaps ahead of its time and and the the uh, you know the late justice krishna ayer who um had a particular felicity of language um dealt with it in this manner he said art morals and laws manacles on aesthetics are a sensitive subject where jurisprudence meets other social sciences and never goes alone to bark and bite because state made straight jacket is an inhibitive prescription for a free country unless enlightened society actively participates in the administration of justice to ethics the world's greatest paintings sculptures songs and dances india's lustrous heritage the konarks and khajurahos lofty epics luscious in patches may be asphyxiated by law if prudes and prigs and state moralists prescribe paradigms and proscribe heterodoxies it is plain that the procedural issue is important and the substantive issue portentous and this is as far back as 1979 um so can i there's enough there's enough in judgments yeah there's enough in judgments which which recognizes the difficulty involved with the subjective element but also recognizes the dangers of excessive control recognizes that you know we must think about an ordinary individual of common sense and not the most vulnerable or the weakest amongst us and we must step out of ourselves to apply some sort of objective test so we have two questions that would actually point us to a nuanced aspect of the complexity of what you just talked about and that is the questions are from haima sundaram and uh, haima sundaram and georgina madoff uh, both are sort of drawing our attention to the fact that are we not in looking at somebody being able to decide on the artist's validity and balance overturning the role of the artist in breaking new grounds uh, and uh, the second question would uh, is uh, uh, the fact that uh, artists are supposed to be the ones who sort of you know are ahead of their times they sort of catalyze change in society but then you're going to make that same society judged by its contemporary standard the work that the artists have produced these are the two questions that i thought you may want to weave into either con- as a continuity to this answer or to the next uh, point that you were going to raise for which i interrupted you no i i i you know i'll 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 answer that or try to answer that straight away which is that um, it's true you see ultimately as i said um speech which needs protection expression which requires protection is that which goes against the grain which challenge challenges our established notions our mores uh, and and our uh, including our contemporary standards so to that extent um it's correct that 
an artist uh, and free speech is about pushing the envelope. Yes. It's only if we have ideas which challenge what we believe and what we think that we will evolve and we will change. Um, and so therefore, if we, it's a good question that if we judge them by a particular yardstick, which is the prevailing yardstick, then, then wouldn't it be stifling that voice and that expression? True, but it, there is a, an inbuilt protection, which is that if you look at how the law looks at obscenity, it is a very extreme end of the spectrum. So only because, as I said, uh, it, the law distinguishes something which you somebody may find dis distasteful or unpleasant, the law recognizes that at the heart of freedom of speech is the right to offend. There's nothing wrong with that. So merely because somebody is upset or offended or feels slighted or, or doesn't like something, um, you know, has a strong reaction to it, there's no, no ground to interfere with that expression. But at the same time, um, there may be some extreme end of the spectrum which needs some safeguard. Now, that, that, that degree uh, and that spectrum will vary from country to country. Um, a society, ultimately our laws are there to, to have a particular order in society and there will always be, there will always be some element of those contemporary standards creeping in. So for instance, uh, uh, you know, everybody would agree that child pornography is something which is at an extreme end of the spectrum, which is impermissible, right? So there are those easy cases in that sense, but there will be more difficult ones. And in a particular context, in a particular country, with particular sensitivities, it's arguable that you need to have some check. Now, the issue is not with the law in theory. The problem that is faced uh, by artists today is with the law in practice, and it doesn't quite in practice operate as it does in theory because all these principles are well and good and all these judgments are well and good, but the policeman doesn't know them and the policeman acts on the dictates of his political masters. Unfortunately, that's the reality. And the process is the punishment when it comes to the law, unfortunately. So that's, that's, that's the problem. It's a larger problem. I don't think the problem lies, as I say, with the law as it stands on the books. I don't think it lies as mm -hmm. much with the law as it stands in its interpretation by courts. Sure, there are at times judgments which are aggressive or views which are aggressive. Um, but over time, we have seen a mature approach by and large by the higher judiciary. The problem is that people get attacked for things which are don't fall foul of the law, which the higher judiciary will intervene to ultimately protect. But in the process, what the artist is put through has a very inhibiting effect and one which has what we call a chilling effect yes. on that creativity. The case of MFSN is a perfect case of that, you know, um, exactly the rules weren't known, the laws weren't known by those who were on the streets breaking in or the policemen who were not doing enough to stop the whole situation. And you really fought, uh, fought a very uh, brave and like a gladiator almost uh, case for MF Hussain, you got him vindicated, you got a judgment in the process that is a masterful work of art. Uh, I mean, literature of its, by itself, delivered by Justice Sanjay Kishan Kaul, who was then in the Delhi High Court, now in the Supreme Court. And I would like to mention to all our viewers uh, that, you know, this is a judgment that you really must read, not only because it is very sensitively written, but it is written from a very philosophical point of view. And that eventually, as we know from the fact that Mr. Sybil himself chose the 
the uh, profession of law because he loved philosophy so much is philosophy in practice, you know, philosophy actually making a difference on the ground. That judgment is truly remarkable. Now, um, the question I really want to ask you is what were the specific principles uh, that inspired you in your arguments before Justice Call in the M.F. Hussain case? Yeah, so, um, you know, one thing I realized very quickly, I mean, I, there, it, it, it related to a painting which he didn't name as Bharat Mata, but it got titled as that because he, you know, gave it to some gallery and the gallery sort of on some online auction titled as it, it as that. And so it, it was known as the so-called Bharat Mata painting. And it was the, it was, you know, it depicted uh, the nude figure of a woman uh, who was in a pose, which, um, you know, was as the map of India. And there was nothing graphic at all in the depiction of nudity. It was very mild. And, uh, you know, there's certainly much more, uh, many more paintings um, and much more art and sculpture, both ancient and contemporary, um, which is far, far more graphic and sexually explicit. And this had none of that. There was no, if, if you just looked at it, you would not find, um, you know, anything which, at least to my mind, an ordinary person of common sense would consider obscene by any standard. But what I realized very quickly is that unfortunately, um, you know, these expressions of offense are not spontaneous uh, and genuine expressions. These tend to be persons who are either looking for some sort of uh, attention to be in the limelight and more often than not have a particular political bent and they are working out a political agenda. So A, I realized that very quickly and uh, a great illustration is that, you know, um, because it was widely discussed in the media and, and I also used to participate in some of that conversation and, you know, a person, you know, it was as absurd as this. Somebody would go to a person who has never seen the painting and say, this gentleman artist has painted your gods and goddesses in an offensive manner. Are you offended? The person would say, yes. This was the level of understanding and reaction. So one of the things that really, um, you know, and it's a part of the judgment that is often overlooked. One of the principles that, you know, I had in mind when I sort of uh, put my heart and soul into it was to address the court on how the provisions of law are being misused and how artists are being harassed and how they are being made to run uh, and tackle cases when FIRs are filed all over the country in several states. And, you know, we would learn about cases by in the newspaper. We'd not get any summons from a court. We'd open the newspaper and you know there would be a report that there's some case filed in Madhya Pradesh, there's some case filed in UP and so on and we'd have to find out where it is, what it is, how to challenge it. So this was one aspect of the judgment and the court ultimately took note of that and said that look there's a problem with, with the way our criminal procedure code is framed and he, he called the uh, 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 additional solicitor general and said in the judgment that, look, you need to go back to the government and, and think about how, what legislative change you can make, what safeguards you can, uh, you know, think about so that this doesn't happen. Of course, nothing came of it and, you know, it's, it's dead letter. But that was one part. The other aspect was that after I spoke to Hussain Saab at length, I, you know, understood and felt, you know, empathized with his agony because he said to me, and I remember this very, very clearly, and it was, of course, uh, he said it in a fluid way over time and so on, but he, he conveyed to me that, look, my whole life, my whole artistic career and everything that I paint has been about my love and respect for the composite culture of this country. I am inspired by, you know, the, the figures that I paint and, you know, he was perplexed. He said, what, how can anybody say any of this is obscene? And, and uh, you know, as uh, uh, those who are 
in the know about Indian art will will I, I've often uh, you know um, uh, people have commented to me artists well known artists and art historians that according to us uh, you know he was uh, not cutting edge at all and he wasn't pushing the envelope in that sense he may have been a great artist and made such a contribution so what was very disheartening and distressing was that um, and and. That's something I did put across to the court and it finds mention in the judgment that here we have, number one, this history of sexuality in sculpture, in art, you know, and, and, uh, and you have this mild painting which has nothing remotely obscene by any sensible yardstick. And yet you have this gentleman who's being hounded. And let me just read out to you a couple of passages of how that argument ultimately weighed and hats off to, to the learned judge because he really did go out of his way to think about it, to do his own research. I actually went to bookshops and got a bunch of books and placed them and filed them in court as complete books and said, look, here is our art. I'm ignorant, I'm a lawyer, but here's what I can show you is part of our art culture, which I know, you know, as a, as a you know, general knowledge. And this is what the court had to say. Today, Indian art is confidently coming of age. Every form of stylistic expression in the visual arts from naturalism to abstract expressionism derives its power from the artist's emotional connection to his perceptual reality. The nude in contemporary art, a perennial art subject considered to be the greatest challenges in art has still not lost its charm and focuses on how the human form has been reinterpreted by the emerging and influential artists today. The paintbrush has become a powerful tool of expression as the pen is for some, and has thus occasionally come under the line of fire for having crossed the Lakshman Rekha and for plunging into the forbidden, which is called obscene, vulgar, depraving, prudent, and immoral. No doubt this form of art is a reflection of a very alluring concept of beauty. And there is certainly something more to it than pearly flesh. But what needs to be determined is which art falls under the latter category. India has embraced different eras and civilizations, which has given her a color of mystery and transformed into her glorious past, adapting various cultures and art forms. In the Mughal period too, one may see murals and miniatures depicting mating couples. That has been the beauty of our land. Art and authority have never had a difficult relationship until recently. In fact, art and artists used to be patronized by various kings and the elite class. It is very unfortunate that the works of many artists today who have tried to play around with nudity have come under scrutiny and have had to face the music, which has definitely made artists to think twice before exhibiting their work of art. Therefore, looking at a piece of art from the painter's perspective becomes very important, especially in the context of nudes. What needs to be seen is that the work is not sensational for the sake of being so, and hence needs to be understood before any objections are raised. The courts have been grappling with the problem of balancing the individual's right to speech and expression and the frontiers of exercising that right. The aim has been to arrive at a decision that would protect the quality of life without making closed mind a principal feature of an open society or an unwilling recipient of information, the arbiter to veto or restrict freedom of speech and expression. It is most unfortunate that India's new puritanism is being carried out in the name of cultural purity and a host of ignorant people are vandalizing art and pushing us towards a pre-Renaissance era. So this is, you know, this, this is the, these are the powerful words in that judgment. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, despite that, um, you know, he, uh, Hussain Saab never returned and he sort of stayed in exile and, you know, he was in his 90s and I asked him and I, I'm just sharing this with you that that I a lot of his, his supporters said to me that, look, why don't you reach out to him now? You've got this wonderful judgment and, you know, let him, why do not he return? And uh, I spoke to him about that. And, you know, he said to me, he said, look, at this age, I don't want to go back and be thinking when is the policeman next going to knock on my door? You know, that's not, and he said that I'm disappointed because I have, you know, given my life uh, to my expression and, and I've done it with love. And, and this is, so that's, that's the tragedy. That's the tragedy 
that you know there's something afoot and this is in 2008 when the court recognized that there is some element now which is trying to you know take us in fact taking us back is to a more sexual era but it's it's where it's taking us we don't know and it's and it's fueled by ignorance and nothing else and and, and we are more than a decade down the line and uh, uh, we are facing the worst of it now yeah so actually, you know, it's very interesting that you read out this passage from the book because the title for today's talk, Crossing the Line, is actually picked up from this judgment. The second thing I wanted to mention to you is that pattern, when I first read this judgment and I familiarized myself with the uh, Hussein case, this city to city kind of, you know, kabi yaha, kabi waha, in different cities, there would be these cases filed, is an example of what is today called a toolkit, you know. And the third thing I wanted to tell you is that it is really sad that uh, we, a land where, I, I don't know if any of those art books that you put before the Honorable Justice or you had a chance to read about this figurine in Indian art called the called Lajagori. It is probably the most graphic image of a woman's sexuality. Uh, sensuality and physical form. So in, at, through many lenses, you could get into trouble with this. And we have them in abundance from the north to the south of India, from the east to the west of India. And today, as you pointed out that so many years down the line, I find Lajagori figures actually having a little skirt nailed on them. I act, We enter another area of, are, are we not destroying our ancient heritage with that? But to continue, and this will be the last question I'm going to ask you, and you can take your time answering it, is uh, drawing from so many years after this incident, after this judgment, we are still dealing with it. There is an increased involvement of uh, legal issues with arts today. Uh, today's artists live in this parallel reality of uh, policing, facing them, infliction of violence, vigilantism, both by state actors and non-state actors, you know. So any art that is difficult bumps into thing, even arts that we assume are not difficult. Comedy show bumps into very severe kinds of human rights deprivations in today's environment. I'm not even beginning to talk about marginalized groups of, uh, minoritized groups of women, of queer people, art that is emanating from them. <coughs> that even though we got rid of section 377, we are still keeping that mindset going and taking it out on our arts. Where does this end? And can we not invert this increasing closeness between law and art? to serve art finding its center, its Kendriya Bindu once again, you know? I think, I, I think, that, it's, I think that it's important uh, to recognize where the problem lies. And I don't think that the problem lies, as I said earlier, with the law as it is in the law books or in our constitution, because those laws and Yes, there are there are some laws which certainly maybe require reworking, um, you know, maybe even uh, removal. But for the most part, that's not a problem. And as I said, even with obscenity, um, it can be applied in a flexible way. But ultimately, the law will reflect what society tolerates and doesn't tolerate to some extent. It will not be completely divorced, even though it is intended to protect the non-majority voice, but it, it, it is unlikely to be completely separated and severed from what is happening in society. At times, law can act to change society. It can, it can push society in a particular direction, which is a uh, you know, of the constitutional values that, um, you know, we believe in. But there will be some degree of resonance with society. Now, the real problem here is not 
those laws. And, and everybody, because the issues that people face are legal issues, they always think that there's a problem with the law in the sense of how it's formulated, what it says, um, and what, what offenses are prescribed. That's not the problem. The problem is with the enforcers of the law who do not act independently, who do not act with the appropriate knowledge of the law, and at the most basic level, the uh, 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 you know, executive, the police, are act with motivation at times. And as I say, carry out a particular agenda. What we need to fight though, and there is, I feel, a, a, another narrative at play, which is not just that freedom of speech and expression as a right is being attacked or undermined. I believe that it is being undermined as a value. And there is a distinction there because right is all about the law, but value is about our society. Do we as a society value freedom of speech and expression? Or do we believe, do we, do we shun dissent? Are we open to dissent? Do we, do, we, do we embrace a culture which recognizes the individual's voice even if it goes against the community voice? Do we respect it? Do we have that culture of respecting freedom of speech? We did at some point. I'm sure that many people still do, but there is also another force at play, I feel, which is trying to undermine freedom of speech as a value. So people who voice opposition to a particular dispensation are branded. There is terminologies. I don't want to make it too political, but that's what's happening. You yeah. know, people are branded, people are shouted down. We, we see it. Conversations are no longer civil. And there is another evolution which is fueling the conflict, which is a change that has taken place. It's a sea change, which is that the avenues of expression have enhanced so dramatically over the last decade, 15 years, 20 years, that those who had no voice now have a voice which is a great enabler. Mm -hmm. But we as a country and as a, and the world at large, other societies also, are grappling with the, with the side effects, if you will, of and the conflict that is being created by so much freedom of expression. I don't know, because, you know, actually social media has become one of the sites where young people and their artwork, because they're not getting those many spaces. So you put it out in social media. The trolling there is terrible. And as I said, all ties groups are getting trolled. LGBTQIA groups, women artists, they are getting trolled there. So all this while, so even the social media and the proper galleries, the old ways that we knew uh, before COVID uh, are visible public ways, okay? But there is a question about a very milestone incident that happened, which was the case, I think the year is 2007 or 2008 of Chandra Chur, uh, the artist who was at the MS University in Baroda and his exhibition was not even, his artwork was not even being exhibited publicly. Yet, you know how it is that through subterranean passages, the knowledge of what that art uh, work contained went out and it resulted in um, you know, his arrest and nobody stood with him except for one particular professor of his a uh, gentleman by the name of Shivaji Panikar and he was eventually rusticated from the department. Now remember the year and it is in Vadodhra. No, you're, you're right. And, and one of the problems is that you see what if Ultimately, when there is an attack by non-state actors, as you said, uh, on freedom of expression, it is imperative, imperative that state actors step in and stand by that person. So 
um, you will have jurisdictions where that kind, when faced with that kind of an attack, <clears throat> the state will say, look, you have the freedom, we will give you protection, we will ensure that you can exhibit your works and nobody will come in the way. So the, the, the state may step in that, the judiciary may step in. What happens here is, unfortunately, is that when there is, and I, I, I refuse to believe that it is spontaneous expressions of uh, offense by non-state actors, it's almost always politically motivated. But what happens is that faced with that, the government, the state, and the judiciary at times, it takes an approach of telling the person, why don't you do something less controversial? Why are you, why are you offending? It happens in courts also. The courts say, yes, yes, you're right. We understand you have this you know, wonderful right. But why don't you apologize and put an end to it? Finish it off. You know, go for mediation. That, that kind of an approach, to my mind, strikes at the very root of it. Because as I said, freedom of speech is nothing if not the right to offend. And if you don't have that right, you don't have freedom of speech. Anybody can take offense at anything. Let them do so. If they don't like it, don't view it. You know, don't see it, ignore it, uh, speak out against it, protest against it. But the culture we have is to ban it, to attack it, to shout it down. And that's when I say that do we really understand freedom of speech as a value? You know, if we, we need to stop talking about it only in legal terms and think about it, you know, as a society, do we appreciate it as a value or are we so steeped in our communitarian culture that you know we believe that individual voices against the community are to be shut down? I mean, very frank. I mean, at it's a personal level. Now, yeah. I, I, growing up, I mean, there is an element of our culture that is that. Growing up as a as a uh, you know young man, I remember I was taught, and you know that's part of our culture. There's you know the, it's it's not to be sort of denigrated. But I was taught, don't question your elders, right? Don't speak up. We were not encouraged, speak up at the dinner table, express your voice. What were we told at school? Conform. Wear the uniform, conform. Don't ask too many questions. If you, I had a young person coming to me recently saying, you know, my teacher called my parents saying, you've asked too many questions in class. So we need to, we need to think a little more deeply do we, because at the heart of freedom of speech is individual voice. These rights are meant to encourage individuals and where individuals have full play, which we do see in some Western jurisdiction where it, their voice gets greater play, there's a greater tolerance in society. There, is, there are shrill voices, but there is a culture of respecting freedom of speech as an individual value as a, and an individual right. And there, uh, you know, people's creativity is less inhibited, you know, and so I, I, the fear I have is that this, you know, the assault is so deep that we are reaching a stage where the law cannot reach otherwise, which is that now it's not just freedom of expression that is being inhibited, but with a creative person, an artist, it's freedom of thought itself, which the law cannot reach. Freedom of thought is absolute, right? It's only expression that can be uh, uh, circumscribed. But what's happening is the artist is now thinking at the source of creation that, oh, let me not be creative about this because it's a controversial area. They're, they're you know, second guessing themselves. And, and that means that now there is thought control that is happening. That's, that's where we're headed, which is worrisome. That is indeed worrisome. Um, but uh, drawing from the words that you have spoken as we come to the end of this session, I will only just say that actually what we are watching, and, and this is a hopeful, desperate, hopeful thought that I'm holding on to, that as we are watching the diminishing of the individual's right, we are now realizing the need for society to safeguard the values that, an in, that the freedom of speech entails, you know. So the progressiveness and all that, pushing the envelope, as it were, are those values that we value? And if, if we do, we now need to think in that 
more desperate frame rather than, oh, my individual right is because, you know, we may still question an individual's right, but as a society, we are doomed if we do not realize what is happening, uh, you know, at the level of values that we uphold. So I think, unless there are any questions, like, give me a minute. No, oh yes, I need to make one correction. I think when I spoke, I said Chandra Chur as an uh, artist from Baroda, the gentleman's name is Chandra Mohan, which is sorry. Ah, yes, yes, yes. yes yeah, yes, I do right, make yeah. mistakes. Now, now I recall, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So anyway, I think that this is, there are no further questions coming and we've reached the time that I had asked you to give to us. Thank you so much, Akhil, for sparing time. Uh, once again, you are most generous with your thoughts and ideas and it's a pleasure to listen to you. You too have that felicity that you talked about in Justice Iyer. <laughs> Thank you, you're Thank you too very kind. much, Thank Tap, you. for doing this. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the session. We did lots of food for thought and some urgency in what we need to think about next. Bye. Hello.